today's Distinguished Speaker Series. And if we have any guests from outside of uh, Pembroke and the campus area, we want to welcome you to campus. We want to hope that you come back and see us soon. A couple of quick announcements. First of all, we'd like to thank the Manhattan Institute for sponsoring today's speaker. And uh, Dr. Frederick will introduce today's speaker in just a moment. We'd like to announce that on Wednesday, September 23rd, our second distinguished speaker of this uh, semester will be on campus from 3.30 to 5 in Moore Hall Auditorium. His name is Bill Frezza. He's with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. All are welcome to come and participate on that day. Um, also, if you're here today and you would like for this to count towards your passport credit, if you're a student here to count towards your passport credit, make sure that you've signed in either on the way in or the way out this afternoon after today's presentation. This session is being streamed live to online students. There will be a question and answer session following the presentation, at which time you may ask questions as well as our online students that will be uh, fielding questions in a chat room. And I'd like to ask all students that you stay in your seats for the entire presentation after the presentation's over and after the question and answer period is over, we'll open the line for refreshments and everyone can enjoy a collaborative environment at that time and meet our special guest as well. Okay? So without further ado, Dr. Frederick is going to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Jim Frederick. Again, we want to thank the Manhattan Institute for uh, bringing Evgeny Feynman uh, to, to speak with us. Uh, we've had several speakers from the, from the Manhattan Institute uh, institution recently. Uh, you may remember that the, in the spring of this year, we had uh, Diana Ferchkett Roth uh, here to speak about uh, the problems of trying to deal with global warming. Uh, Mr. Feynman, Feynman has contributed to outlets such as Forbes, the Washington Examiner, uh, Medical Progress Today, and Fox News, and several out other outlets. And he's had uh, two uh, op-ed pieces in Health Affairs. So he has had some, uh, some academic background. Um, his work includes analyses of healthcare costs in the United States, of Medicare, of the Patient Protection Act, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, of 2010. Uh, Feynman and two of, of, his, of his colleagues released the Obamacare impact map in 2013, which was a state-by-state -state look at the effects of the Affordable Care Act. The Republican strategist Carl Rove called the map an indispensable tool uh, in understanding the law's effects on the Americans. Mr. Feynman earned his bachelor's degree in economics and political science, and as an economist, I'm glad to hear that, um, at, at, the, at Hunter College, which is part of the City University of New York system. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Feynman. Thank you for that introduction. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming to hear this talk. Uh, you know, just just so you understand, um, you know, the Manhattan Institute. We certainly have, uh, you know, an, an, a particular agenda. There's uh, some some bias in a lot of the way that, that we think about things. But the individual fellows that come from the Manhattan Institute, we each have our own opinions, ideas. I often disagree with my colleagues; they disagree with me. Uh, if there's something you disagree with. Feel free to uh, ask questions at the end. I'm more than happy to uh, to try to clear anything up. Um, the only other thing, uh, because I don't have a clicker, you'll see me pointing uh, over there to have the slides change. So uh, just so just so you know, it's going to be a little bit a little bit weird like that. Um, but again, thanks for having me. And I'll just get started with a short video that I think gets to the heart of how American healthcare really works. Um, on the next slide. So this is called the Fair Travel Work Like Healthcare. Um, we're not going to watch the whole video, it's seven minutes long, but at this point uh, I think there's a really, really good kind of rant about what's wrong with American healthcare and it gets you thinking about how airlines would look 
if, if they worked at all like our healthcare system. Great sheets. Prices are privately negotiated. So there's really no way you could compare us and shop. Oh. Did you want to go ahead then? No. I, I do not want to go ahead. I do not want to go anywhere. I want to jump off a cliff. This system is insane. It's fragmented to the point of incoherence. Record keeping is stuck in the 1960s. Communication is stuck in the 1980s. None of the systems talks to the others. Everyone reinvents the wheel at every stage in the process. There's no pricing transparency. In a sane modern system, I wouldn't have to arrange each leg of my flight myself. I wouldn't have to fax documents around, find and juggle multiple providers, fill out again and again what are essentially the same forms every time I use a provider. In a sane system, I'd call an airline and it would give me a price for the whole trip, not just one part of it. It would sell me a safe, round-trip journey instead of a series of separate procedures. It would have back office personnel using modern IT systems. Automatically, at the press of a button, once I enter a password, they'd be able to look up my travel history. We'd do most of this stuff online. In fact, Cynthia, I would be able to arrange a whole trip with a single phone call. Sir, please, calm down and be realistic. I'm sure the system can be frustrating, but consumers don't understand flight plans and landing slots. And even if they did, there are thousands of separate providers involved in moving travelers around, and hundreds of airports and millions of trips. Getting everyone to coordinate services and exchange information just isn't realistic, and a business as complicated as travel. Yes, I, I suppose I'm dreaming. Was there anything else I can help you with? No. My goal today was to provide you with outstanding service. So basically what was happening here is Jonathan Rausch, the, the guy who made that video, he was trying to book a ticket to travel to uh, Baltimore, I think, on one date. Uh, instead, the receptionist he spoke to gave him alternatives uh, three months later, one month earlier, uh, because those, those are the only dates they could accommodate him. Um, if you've ever uh, had any kind of experience with the ER, uh, specialists, primary care doctors, you know, you, you know what that's like. You go to your doctor, you have to make a follow-up, you have to call the specialist yourself, you've got to figure out if he or she is in your network. You need to figure out how much you're going to have to pay uh, for your copay, your deductible, Someone's got to pay the premiums. If you're buying insurance on your own, you've got to pay those premiums. If you've got insurance through your job, someone else is paying them. But it's a whole big, complicated process, and it's very different from any other sector of the economy. Um, that's basically why we talk about healthcare more than any other country. Uh, we're the only country with a system really as ridiculous as this uh, for, for a lot of reasons. And all those reasons together contribute to the fact that it makes up 18% of our economy. Um, and they contribute to the fact that we don't really get any kind of value out of our system. Um, it's really not problematic if we're spending 18% of our economy, our economy is $17 trillion, so that's a lot of money. It's about $3 trillion right now. It really isn't problematic if we're getting a lot for that spending. Uh, no one really cares how much we spend in other sectors of the economy because we know what kind of value we're getting them, what we're getting uh, from those sectors. We know that people are making decisions to spend their money in those sectors. That's all, all well and good. Um, it's not the same in healthcare, and I'll try to go into a lot of the reasons why. I won't get into too much depth because there's so many of the reasons. But again, if you have questions at the end of the presentation, I'm happy to discuss more of them. Um, so let's begin with how we pay for healthcare because in many ways that distinguishes us from the rest of the world. This, uh, this chart uh, is just one example of how one small part of our healthcare system pays for healthcare. So if you're 65 or older, you're going to be eligible for Medicare. It's uh, a federal government program for the elderly and the disabled, it provides healthcare, it's been around since 1965. And if you're poor, uh, you're eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. If you're not poor, you're only eligible for Medicare. Uh, from there, you have a choice of going with a private plan or a traditional government-run plan. If you choose a private plan, you get to pick from all sorts of different plans that fall generally into one of these three categories. If you go with a government-run plan, uh, that government-run plan will pay doctors and hospitals through different fee schedules. They'll pay them different amounts that vary based on where they're located, how much they say things cost. 
going even further into that, they pay based on, some, some of them pay based on volume, others pay based on quality. There's really no method to the madness. Uh, what's really interesting about this, uh, seniors are about 14, 15% of the population. Um, out of personal healthcare spending, that is, you know, paying for things like doctors, uh, prescription drugs, they can make up nearly one third. So even just looking at this sliver tells you how one third of our healthcare system looks like. It's really much more complicated than this, but this is a relatively simple look at what goes on there. The next kind of uh, interesting question is, how do we actually pay for healthcare? Who's, who's really paying? So a lot of people have a conception that in the US, as opposed to other countries, everyone is pretty much on their own. They're paying out of their own pocket. Um, it's far from the case. Uh, in 2012, out-of-pocket spending was about 14%. You can see that government spending made up nearly 50%. Um, it's a little, it's, it's a bit more uh, today in 2014-2015. Uh, in uh, private health insurance picks up a large share of the tab, but government programs like the VA, Medicare, and Medicaid also cover uh, a big share of spending. Um, this also includes things like charity care, hospitals often, uh, often provide care for people who can't afford it otherwise. So it's a very, very fragmented system. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but without the right incentives, it works out to not work very well. Uh, this is a really common chart that's used to look at how the US healthcare system differs from, from other countries. Uh, some of you may have seen this, but basically this is looking at what healthcare spending in the US is as a share of the economy compared to uh, other members of the OECD, other Western developed countries primarily. Um, obviously something's, something's out of whack here. Uh, you've got some, some variety in spending. Uh, you know, Estonia is spending somewhere around 5%. Some more developed countries are spending a little over 10%. And you would expect that as a country gets richer, people want more and more expensive healthcare. And, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but when things are this out of whack for the U.S., which is around 18% in this chart, um, it's fair to ask some questions about why we're actually spending that much. Um, going back to what I said before, one, one of the things that distinguishes us from other countries is that we do spend more. Every element of our healthcare sector spends more. It's not only in the private side, but our government spends more too. So, the UK, which has uh, a national healthcare system, it's uh, about as close to single payer as you can get, uh, spend, their government spends significantly less than our government. Um, there's a lot of reason for that. Part, part of it is because European countries set prices. They tell providers, uh, drug companies, how much they're going to pay them. Our government doesn't do that quite as much, at least not universally. But that's certainly not the whole explanation. At the same time, even though we do have people paying, uh, paying more into the system through things like private, private health insurance, we actually do more to protect people in the sense that compared to other OECD countries, we actually spend less as a share of our total spending out of pocket. Um, this is things like co-pays, deductibles, anything that's not covered by private insurance or the government, anything, anything that comes out of your own pocket. Um, again, so this, this uh, is a really interesting phenomenon. What's happening here, uh, part of it is because we have programs like Medicare and Medicaid, which pretty much require uh, almost no, almost no uh, contribution from beneficiaries. Um, the other element is this big employer-sponsored health, uh, health insurance that we have, which I'll get into later, but one other element that distinguishes us from our allies, from uh, other developed nations, is that we typically provide insurance through employers, and employers have an incentive to over-provide that insurance. Uh, we'll get to that shortly. Um, I want to move on to the value that we get for all this spending. Uh, we spend a lot, we spend differently than other countries, and I said before, we really don't get much value out of it. Um, we have lower life expectancy than the OECD. Um, the, the caveat being that there's a lot of variation between states. Uh, New York has a very high life expectancy, over 80 years uh, for, for both genders. Uh, meanwhile, Mississippi has the lowest in the United States and would probably fall with some uh, uh, less developed countries or developing countries. Um, 
in terms of the in terms of its life expectancy. Um, there's huge variation across all sorts of uh, all, all sorts of divisions. There's a big variation across racial groups, across economic groups, uh, across income groups. Um, life expectancy is a little more compact in the OECD. There's more homogeneity. People are more more alike. Uh, there are other things that explain this besides healthcare, many things. Um, for instance, the U.S. has one of the highest obesity rates, if not the highest obesity rate in the developed world. Uh, that contributes to diseases like diabetes, uh, heart disease, and those are some of the most prevalent and uh, costly diseases that we have in our country. Uh, nevertheless, this is a problem given how much we spend on health care. Um, one example that people like to use to point out uh, good things about the U.S. healthcare system is uh, what's called the five-year survival rate, survival rate excuse me, for breast cancer. What that means is you've detected something that you think is breast cancer, and five years later the patient is still alive. Um, on the one hand, that's a very good metric because you want to know whether patients are living after you've detected some tumor or something that might indicate breast cancer. On the other hand, if you detect something that never would have metastasized, that never would have been dangerous, and you operate or uh, it just go, goes into the uh, national statistics as a possible tumor and nothing ever happened of it, what you're doing is inflating your statistics. You're making it look as though you're reducing mortality when you're actually not. Um, on the next slide, I'll show you how this plays out. Um, screening rates in the US are among the highest in the OECD for breast cancer. Uh, Depending on, on, on the year, we uh, some years were number one, others number two, number three. Um, but mortality rates are actually pretty constant year over year, and our mortality rates are a little better than average, but they're certainly not where they should be given our screening rates and given how much we invest in preventing breast cancer. Uh, the point is, we do a, we we do spend a lot, you know, in this in this particular area on breast cancer, on some other cancers too, but we focus a lot on screening, and there's diminishing returns for those of you that are, uh, that, that are taking an econ class, there's diminishing marginal returns. The more you screen, uh, the, more, the more you'll find, but the more po false positives you'll start getting. And when you start getting those false positives, you start introducing uh, lower and lower cost effectiveness uh, for, for the treatment, or the screening in this case. Um, I, I sort of alluded to this earlier, but an important question arises often in discussions of the U.S. of the economics of the U.S. healthcare system is whether the whether the U.S. healthcare system is a uh, a free market based system. Um, many on the left would say yes. Uh, many on the right would say yes too. Uh, both would be mistaken. Um, we're about as far from a free market as you can get. In fact, I'd argue that. Uh, France, which uh, has universal health care and the government participates heavily in paying for health care, is more market-based than we are, uh, just because prices are more transparent. Um, the major necessary condition for, for a market is to have prices. So I should be able to call an MRI imaging center and ask them how much it's going to cost to get an MRI uh, without them asking me what insurance I have, um, whether I qualify for Medicaid, who referred me. Um, I should be able to, if you know, I need a knee, a knee replacement. I should be able to call up hospitals and get quotes on knee replacements before going in, getting my knee replacement done, and then getting a surprise bill from a doctor that apparently wasn't covered by my insurer. It shouldn't matter what insurance I have. It shouldn't matter whether I'm covered by Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, the VA. The price should be pretty much the same across the board, with exceptions for quality differences. Uh, quality differences do not explain price differences in the U.S. healthcare system. Um, in the next few slides, I'll show why. But what we effectively have is capitalism without prices and socialism without budgets. Uh, what that means is no one knows what anything costs, and we never put a cap on how much we spend through our government programs. So even uh, single-payer systems have some kind of global budget. The UK sets a limit to how much they'll spend on health care. And because of that, they have to make some tough, de tough decisions about rationing the care. Uh, we do no such thing. In fact. In Medicare, we, we have banned ourselves from rationing. Um, Medicaid does that uh, a little bit uh, on, on the fringes, but even then, um, Medicaid programs typically try to avoid rationing. Um, again, ju just to kind of drive home the point of 
why we're not a free market system, uh, a growing share of Americans are on government-sponsored insurance. Um, yeah, I'm, I present this without any kind of uh, bias about whether, whether this is good or not. It, it may very well be a good thing, but it's certainly not a free market when a third of the country is being covered by public insurance. Um, in addition to, the, to that, uh, about 44%, as we saw, of total health expenditures are government funded. This doesn't include a very important tax exclusion for employer-sponsored coverage, uh, which, which we'll get to in a little bit. But once you add that in, it's very possible that total spending does approach 50% or even higher for, for the government. Um, what I mentioned before is there's this big price variation. There's no such thing as a price. Um, colonoscopies are no better in New York than they are in San Francisco, basically. There's no reason why a colonoscopy in New York should cost $8,500 while, uh, while a colonoscopy in San Francisco costs $4,800. These are completely unexplained by quality differences. Um, you know, when you're, when you're shopping for any other good, you're, you, know, you want to buy uh, an iPhone. Uh, you know that an iPhone 6 in New York costs 650 bucks for the base model. Um, that's the same that it costs in San Francisco, Miami, Austin, Seattle, wherever you go. Um, price, price variation, again, to, 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 to get back to this, is fine when there's some kind of quality difference, uh, when there's some kind of difference in the underlying product. So you're going to pay more for um, you know, a five-star restaurant than you are for McDonald's. You're going to pay more for organic beef than you will for uh, you know, regular grade A meat at your supermarket. Um, that's all well and good. Uh, one, one example I like to use is uh, from hospitals in New York. Uh, based on Medicare charge data, um, I say charge data because that's different from prices in an important way, but based on that charge data, there's a hospital that would charge you $100,000 if you came in with a heart attack, on average. Uh, about a mile down the road, there's another hospital that will charge $30,000. Um, I, the hospital that charges 100,000 is actually worse than the one that charges 30,000. I mean, th that's, that's fundamentally a broken system. Um, not only do prices vary by, by state, I alluded to this a little bit, but price, prices vary by county, they vary by hospital, um, a mile, half a mile apart. Uh, what Colorado did is something that, that other states are starting to do they're building what are called all-payer claims databases where they collect information on prices from hospitals, uh, usually with some kind of legal mandate, and they make those prices public in, in this kind of database. Um, what they did here was they looked at how much knee replacements cost across uh, different hospitals. Um, there's really, again, no method to the madness here. Um, most hospitals have more or less the same patient complexity. Um, the, the hospital down there on the left, example, a Good Samaritan, it's a little over 20,000, the hospital uh, second from the top, uh, I can't even read the name there, but uh, that one is closer to 40,000. Uh, there's no reason why that difference should exist. Again, uh, this comes from, uh, from a lot of reasons, but this is very, very problematic. So not only do prices vary by state, by county, by hospital, they vary by who's paying. Um, Medicare typically gets discounts. They set prices. They tell hospitals and providers what they're going to pay them. They pay about 80% of what private insurance does. Uh, Medicaid pays about 60%. If you're uninsured, you might either get a really, really good deal or you really might get shafted. Um, the uninsured might end up paying a huge discount because the provider doesn't have to deal with insurance or they might be stuck with a bill for $40,000 from a hospital and they have no idea why they're getting billed $40,000. Uh, if you've ever been uninsured, you might have experienced this. Um, I, I certainly have. So, again, uh, for, for free markets to work, for markets to exist, there have to be prices. People make decisions based on prices in a market. Uh, you have to be able to say, you know, I do or I don't want to go to the doctor because this is how much he's going to charge me. And if I go to the doctor, I'm not going to be able to spend this money on something else, on food, on a vacation, whatever else. You have to be able to balance the opportunity cost. And people in the U.S. can't do that. Um, this is where I want to get into that employer-sponsored tax exclusion that I mentioned before. Um, what we call private insurance is, in effect, um, 
at least about a third uh, government insurance. Uh, when a company offers insurance to, to its employees, um, that, that's how most people in the U.S. get insurance, about 150, 160 million people. Um, the company gets a huge, huge uh, discount on that. Um, they don't have to pay any kind of taxes on it. You, as the employee, you don't have to pay taxes on it. It's treated as wages, uh, but it's also not subject to payroll taxes like Social Security, Medicare taxes, uh, which are 7.5% roughly shared between um, but the, the employer on one hand, employee on the other. Because uh, the, no one has to pay that, on average the government loses somewhere between 30 and 40 cents on the dollar uh, for every dollar that goes into health insurance. If you're a company, it just makes a lot of sense to funnel as much money into health insurance instead of wages as possible. Um, what you're doing is you're creating an incentive to invest in very expensive plans uh, that protect people from pretty much everything under the sun, but at the same time, those plans, because they protect people from everything under the sun, they don't require much in the way of decision making from patients. Um, what typically, what, what, what's typically happened in the past, less and less so now, is that you'd have a plan that might have a $15 copay, it might have, uh, you know, for, for a physician visit, it might have a $50 copay for an emergency room, um, you have some nominal copays for prescription drugs, and that's about it. Uh, those kind of plans, what they've done is they've, they've said effectively to providers, to hospitals, to drug companies, that no one is really going to look at the prices you charge because we're getting this huge tax break, and no one's going to question those prices. So go ahead and raise prices however you want. So we're not a free market system. Um, all that aside, we still have a problem. And it's still important to diagnose that problem and understand where it comes from, what it looks like, and what possible solutions are. Um, generally, healthcare is too expensive. That's, that's the broad way to frame the problem. Uh, we spend too much, we don't get a lot for it, and prices are too high. Those are two, two different elements of the same problem, and I'll show why in a minute. So first, let's ask which prices are high and why are they high? Um, primarily, uh, three, three, different uh, three different prices. I'll go into two of them because uh, the price for screenings is a little, bit, uh, a little bit more involved. But hospital prices and drug prices, those are the ones that are typically in the news. That's what gets on the front page of the New York Times. That's what people tend to have uh, the most experience with if they've ever uh, had to deal with the healthcare system in a meaningful way. Um, the, this chart, uh, what, it, what's, what it's charting out is the difference in medical prices versus overall prices, uh, or rather non-medical prices in, in the economy. Uh, CPI, it's a, con a consumer price index. It's just a common measure of prices used uh, by the government, by economists. Um, it's pretty, uh, pr pretty, solid, uh, pretty solid data. There are some people who have issues with it, but Overall, it's, it's a good measure of prices. Um, you can see that somewhere around the early 80s, the prices began to diverge, and they diverged drastically. Uh, since the early 80s, medical prices have more than quadrupled. Uh, Non-medical prices have a little more than doubled. Uh, that's a massive, massive difference. And because of that, um, healthcare has grown a, as a share of our economy. It's grown as a share of people's uh, take-home spending, uh, more and more disposable incomes going to health care, and there's really no end in sight, seemingly. Um, those prices can be broken down broadly into a few categories. I'll focus on these two. Uh, hospital spending, hospital prices rather, and drug prices. Uh, both have increased uh, quite significantly. Um, I'll, I'll point one thing out, the dates here are a little bit different just because the breakdown of these prices isn't available as far back as the overall prices, but the story is more or less the same. I wouldn't change much even if you were to get the prices going back. Um, drugs have, have increased quite significantly. Hospital prices have grown even more significantly. Um, just bear, bear that in mind. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be relevant uh, over, over the remaining slides just because understanding where we focus uh, in, in trying to control costs, trying to control spending, um, 
this, the, this understanding is very important. Uh, without understanding where, the, where prices are actually high, uh, more, more than elsewhere, uh, you can't actually slow down spending. You can't come to an adequate solution. Um, the, the big problem, as, as you saw there, is, is hospital prices. Um, but there are basically two, two monopolies. Um, prescription drugs, uh, they, drug companies get patents on drugs that they develop uh, for 20 years, more or less. Uh, no other company is able to release a competing drug. Uh, or no, no other company is, is able to release the same drug, rather. They're not allowed to go in and release it under a new name uh, for 20 years. Um, Hospitals also have monopolies just because we've seen that they have enormous market power um, across the country. Uh, lots of studies have looked at this, but typically um, hospital markets are not very competitive with some exceptions, primarily urban areas. Um, the thing about drug companies, though, that's very different from hospital monopolies is that they have a limit to how long they can maintain high prices. Um, that patent expires after 20 years. Um, Typically, drug companies have about 11 or 10 years of effective patent life once a drug gets approved. So after about 10 or 11 years of being on the market, another company will be able to go in, uh, pump out a generic, and that tends to drop prices pretty significantly. Um, hospitals have no such issue. That's why the price of an MRI has grown steadily over the years. That's why hospital prices have grown much faster than drug prices. There's very, very few competitors able to go in uh, in into a hospital market and say, we're going to do what you do uh, at least as well, but cheaper. It, it just doesn't work. Uh, it's very hard to enter into a, into a hospital market, first because of the fixed costs, but also because uh, hospitals tend to be very well connected politically. Uh, we have a lot of laws limiting how competitors can enter the market. Um, an another way to think about this, the difference between hospital and, and drug spending, drug spending right now is about 10% of US healthcare spending. Uh, over 10 years, uh, government actuaries project that it'll increase by about 0.4%. That's 4 tenths of a percent. Um, hospital spending is about 30% of US healthcare spending. It's expected to increase to about 31, 32%. It's probably not going to increase much more than that. Uh, there are some cost pressures, but those ratios, 10 and 30, have remained more or less steady for uh, 20 years or so. Um, the, the, the important thing to, to keep in mind there is that when you see um, either insurers or uh, whoever else pushing on drug prices, it's, it's certainly good to, to point out when drug prices are too high and there are many drugs for which the prices are too high. But just focusing on drug prices will not even come close to addressing the overall high prices we have in our healthcare system. Um, moving on from, uh, from prices, uh, another interesting way to kind of uh, divvy, this, uh, divvy this up is to, to ask who's doing the spending. It's not that there's some kind of uh, equal distribution. It's, it's not that everyone spends roughly the equal amount. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Uh, it follows roughly uh, an 80-20 rule or a Pareto distribution, which means that roughly each year it changes a little bit year over year, but the top 20% account for somewhere around 80% of spending. Um, just to kind of illustrate what that looks like, uh, median spending, so that's just down the middle, 50% above, 50% below, in 2012 was $853. Uh, that includes the uninsured, that includes the elderly, the young, everyone. Um, average spending was $4,300. Uh, that's, that's huge. And when you have such a massive difference between average spending and median spending, what that tells you is that there's some extremely high spenders pulling up the average um, at the right end of the, uh, of the curve. And the next slide will show you what that curve looks like. Um, so what, what you have on the bottom here is just the percent of the, of the population, the, the, the total cumulative percent. So at 50% over there on the bottom, that's the median. That, that's half, half the population is below, half is above. And on the, uh, on, on the vertical axis, what you have is uh, 
the same thing but for total spending. So as you go up that axis, uh, you see cumulative shares of spending. Um, and what, what you see here for 2009 is that uh, the lower 50% of, spend, of spending, um, low, lower 50% of spenders spent $36 billion out of uh, $1.2, $1.3 trillion. Um, the point is that if you want to at all fix healthcare costs, fix healthcare spending, uh, you have to focus on that higher spending group. So it's not only focusing on where the prices are higher, it's focus, focusing on who's paying them. So if you were to enact reforms or make some kind of changes that only affect that low spending group, healthy people, you're going to do pretty much nothing to the healthcare system. It'll have all, almost no effect, uh, just, just at the margins. Uh, where does the spending for, for that high spending group come from? Uh, primarily chronic diseases. I mean, this is more or less common sense. Um, it's diabetes, it's hypertension, uh, uh, slowly cancer is making it up on that list. Um, and it's, it's primarily concentrated among the elderly. Um, the older you are, the much more likely you are to have a chronic disease, and the much more likely you are to be in that high spending, uh, upper 50%, upper 20%, however you want to divide it. Um, it just correlates with age very, very well, and people are living longer. So what, what we have now is more and more years where people do fall into that upper spending, uh, uh, upper spending group. Um, just uh, here to, to, to kind of illustrate what, what that looks like, um, 92% of the top 5% of spenders had some kind of chronic condition or functional limitation. That means you might have had diabetes or cancer or anything else, um, or you, you weren't able to walk by yourself, you needed assistance walking. Um, only half of the bottom 95% had the same. Um, you could, again, you could divide it up any other way, but this is a good way to illustrate how that spending uh, gets divided not only among age groups, uh, not only among spending groups, but along disease groups. Um, again, I, I said this before, but just to reiterate, without addressing the high cost spenders, you can't reduce healthcare spending. Um, this kind of hits both the left and right a little bit. So uh, typically on the left, uh, health policy proposals uh, deal with expanding insurance coverage. They deal with uh, making sure that everyone has access to preventive care. They uh, might want to introduce some kind of uh, price controls for, dr for drugs. Some of that might reduce spending. Expanding insurance definitely doesn't. Um, price controls for drugs would reduce spending, but it would have uh, other negative effects. Um, that's, that's not how you're going to cut health spending. Uh, they're very populist ideas. They're popular among uh, the, the voter bases that both parties like to court, but just practically speaking, they're not going to do much. Um, same thing for, uh, for the right. Uh, Republicans love to talk about uh, giving every person a health savings account, having them deposit a certain amount of money. For poor people, the government would deposit money, and then you make your own health care decisions. Uh, for healthy people, um, it's great. For sick people, not so much. And giving uh, every healthy person in the country a health savings account won't do anything to health care spending. Um, a note before we continue, prevention doesn't save money. Um, there's a widely held belief that if we just focus on catching diseases earlier and earlier and earlier, we're going to be able to save money in the long run. There's no evidence so far that that happens. Uh, you can look at private companies that implement so-called wellness programs where they give people money for walking a certain number of steps a day, for getting a wellness checkup every year. Um, that hasn't saved money for anyone except maybe Safeway and Colgate Palmolive. Um, dozens, if not hundreds of companies have already tried it, uh, probably even more. And for them, it hasn't done very much. Um, giving people insurance, uh, what I said before, makes them spend more money, and it sort of makes sense. If I tell you that I'm going to give you this financial tool that limits how much you spend on health care, 
you're going to say, you know, all right, maybe I'll make that doctor's visit. Maybe I'll, uh, you know, go go and go and get a checkup. I'll get my prescription filled. Whereas otherwise, maybe you wouldn't because you thought that it wasn't worth it for you when you didn't have insurance. Um, there, there are some some exceptions to the rule. Um, HIV prevention is extremely cost effective and cost saving. Um, stopping people from from smoking. Um, According to the Surgeon General, it does save money. Um, there's, I've, I've heard some arguments to the contrary, uh, basically because smokers die early and they might end up costing the government less money. It's a very cynical way to, view, to, to look at it, but um, purely from, uh, from a practical perspective, it may be true. Um, it's not clear. Um, obesity uh, does drive a lot, of, uh, a lot of spending, but I'll, I'll just note this here, even obesity, uh, things like getting every kid in public school to walk, you know, an extra two or three thousand steps a day won't do anything. Um, we do have uh, about a third of the country that's that's overweight, but only a small section of those people actually are end up being high cost patients. Um, many of them are slightly overweight, a little more than slightly, but they're not that high cost. Um, if you want to reduce costs associated with obesity, again, you have to focus on the highest spending patients. Um, I, I want to, again, drive home the point of why prevention doesn't save money, uh, although prevention could still be a good idea, even if it doesn't save money. Um, this from a study from 2008, uh, right around the election, uh, evaluating preventive measures compared to existing treatment options. And well, the, the way to look at this, the, those first two bars, um, preventive measures and treatments for, for existing conditions all the way on the left, those are the ones that actually save money. Um, everything else costs more money. It might not cost very much money. Um, it might be very cost effective. Um, typically, uh, when economists think about cost effectiveness in healthcare, they use something called quality adjusted life years. Uh, what that means is one year of life lived in uh, perfect health, uh, whatever that means. And roughly the threshold is that if something costs more than $150,000 for one quality adjusted life year, um, it's, not, it's not considered to be cost effective. There are um, different ways of thinking about that depending on which disease you're talking about, if it's one that doesn't have any treatments, um, or if it's one that has a lot of treatments, but that's typically how we look at this. So if you kind of uh, look at everything to the right of the, uh, let's say 50,000 to 100,000, uh, maybe split the next one down the middle, all of those treatments, not only uh, do they not save money, but um, under standard economic analysis, they wouldn't even be cost effective. Um, the ones all the way on the right, they're the worst, they increase costs, and they worsen health outcomes. So that's really, really, really bad that we even have treatments that do that. So solutions. Um, I've talked about a lot of the problems. Um, there are some ideas for how to, uh, how to deal with this. Um, most of them haven't been tried yet, so a lot of it is theoretical, but we have some, some indication that, um, that, that, that some of these ideas might work. Um, when it comes to high prices, as I mentioned earlier, one of the uh, most compelling explanations for high prices is the employer-sponsored uh, tax deduction. Um, you get rid of that deduction, fix that deduction somehow, um, you start introducing some more price sensitivity among employers. Uh, all of a sudden, employers may not want to dump as much money into health insurance as they do now. Um, the ACA, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, begins to do that uh, with something called the Cadillac tax, which is a 40% excise tax on the value of plans above a particular threshold. It's a really good first start. Um, the only problem is that what it necessarily does is for lower income people to bear a bigger share of that cost. So when you have a 40% excise tax, uh, what you're saying is everyone, even low income people who might be paying a tax rate of 10% on their, on their income, they have to pay 40% on that particular good. In this case, that good is the value of plans above a particular threshold. Um, a more progressive approach is to introduce a cap on the deductibility of employer-sponsored benefits. Um, 
but the, the problem with that, and this is why no proposals to actually do this have, uh, have appeared in Congress, is when you introduce a cap, it raises less revenue. And when you raise less revenue, you introduce deficits. And when you introduce deficits, you typically have to cover those deficits somehow. And our politicians haven't figured out the best way to do that. Um, to uh, kind of get, get, get back to why the ESI ex uh, exception, exclusion is, is so bad, um, there's actually one very recent study just from uh, about a month and a half ago uh, that was published in, uh, in Ember um, that actually looked at how hospital monopolies uh, behave. So how, how are hospital monopolies, how are hospitals in general affected by high value health insurance typically provided by employers? And what's really interesting, um, I'm gonna contradict myself a little bit here, uh, because I said earlier that hospitals are very non-competitive, uh, they tend to raise prices, they tend to do that when they're faced with very high value insurance plans. So what that says is hospitals can't raise prices unless they can raise prices. Um, high value insurance plans allow hospitals to raise prices and if you, don't ha if you have slightly lower value insurance plans, those plans do a better job, they either do a better job of negotiating with hospitals or they tend to just exclude the highest cost hospitals from their networks. Um, so step one, fix the exclusion. Um, going back to this issue of hospital competitiveness, uh, let's say fixing the exclusion doesn't actually reduce the value of plans. So non-competitive hospitals can still raise prices as they want. Um, then you, you kind of have two, two options. You can either use the FTC or state regulators to block mergers and, and acquisitions to make the markets more competitive by fiat. Uh, that's very hard to do. The FTC has lost a lot of cases. Recently they've won a few, but they're very cautious about pursuing cases against hospitals um, because they, they don't want to lose. Um, one interesting approach that's being tried both in government and in the private sector is different payment methods. Um, I'll, I'll explain briefly what, what, what these two are. There are others. Uh, Reference-based pricing basically says, here's a knee, here's a knee transplant, knee replacement uh, that, that you want to get. I'll pay $30,000 for it. You figure out where to go. Um, if uh, it costs more than that, you pay the difference. If it costs the same, you pay nothing. Uh, depending on the particular approach, uh, they might even give some incentive for, for cost saving, for going to someone who charges less. Um, the California Teachers Retirement System, CalPERS, uh, which covers over a million people now, they tried something like this in 2008 uh, for knee replacements, hip replacements. I think they moved on to some other indications too. And what they found actually is when they started doing that, high cost hospitals started reducing their prices in order to fall into their network of covered providers. So that's, that's one interesting approach. Uh, the other approach, the one I really prefer, but it's, it's harder to get to, is called capitation. And what that really is, is when an insurer goes to a hospital, a provider, and says, here's some amount of money uh, that I'm gonna give you a month to care for uh, this patient population. Um, you base that, that amount of money uh, based on how sick that patient population is. This is similar to how we pay Medicare Advantage plans uh, in the Medicare market. It's very imperfect. It's hard to properly uh, risk adjust. It's hard to figure out exactly how sick a population is. But when you do it well, what you tell hospitals is you only have a fixed amount of money to play with. So when you're determining what treatments to prescribe, you've got to be really, really cost effective. Um, the last part, uh, transparency requirements, uh, what's, what's really important here is this gets at the, at the patient side. Um, if patients start seeing prices, or it doesn't even have to be prices, it can be quality metrics, it can be safety metrics, um, patients can start making somewhat better choices. Um, we haven't seen very much of this, but um, when uh, the, there was a study recently that looked at uh, how patients make hospital decisions when they're presented with safety information, basically the rate of complications, um, how many times a surgeon left a sponge in a patient, how many times a surgeon operated on the wrong side of the body, um, all sorts of things. Patients tend to choose the safer hospital because people don't want to have a sponge left in their body. Um, the last part 
is the skewed health, uh, health spending, this is really the hardest to, to address. And at some level, we kind of have to accept that we're going to have skewed healthcare spending. The older you are, the sicker you are, the more you're going to spend. If you're really healthy, you just have no reason to spend money. If you're really sick, you will. Um, but what we can do is try to figure out how to, how to reduce some of that spending, how to make the spending difference a little less dramatic. Um, here, again, I'm going to contradict myself a bit. Uh, preventing and curing diseases is important. Um, the difference being, I'm not talking about just screenings for, for diseases. I'm not talking about MRIs, mammograms, x-rays, uh, PSA tests for prostate cancer. Um, I'm talking about really get, getting at diseases at the molecular level. And fortunately, we're at a point where the science is really, really advanced, where we've been able to distinguish uh, lung cancers into thousands of different individual discrete diseases. And what that means is you're able to treat each lung cancer individually rather than just throwing a bunch of chemotherapy at it. Um, that means you have much fewer wasted treatments. Uh, you're, you're not treating patients who you don't think would benefit from the treatment. Um, this is really advanced in, in oncology and cancer treatment, much less so in other disease areas except um, HIV AIDS. Uh, that's, that's why um, HIV AIDS patients uh, for a while were getting cocktails of drugs because doctors were trying to select the, the combination that was most effective based on the type of virus that that patient was infected with. Um, other disease areas are much harder. Uh, really, the big one that would be amazing to, to get to is Alzheimer's. Uh, the company or researchers that manage to do that uh, will probably get a Nobel Prize. Um, but there's all sorts of other diseases. There's rare diseases um, that affect few patients, and we're getting better at treating those. Um, a great example of, of how this might work um, is uh, there was a, uh, a medicine called Gleevec uh, that was approved in 2001, I think, for uh, a specific type of leukemia. Um, before that, those leukemia patients, it's, it's, it's a very specific, uh, it's a specific form of leukemia. They didn't respond to other treatments. But before this drug was approved, uh, you just basically barrage them with the same treatment and hope, hope, it, hope it worked. So this treatment um, for, for this subset of patients pretty much gets rid of symptoms. Um, they live much longer than, uh, than patients before the treatment. And it's not clear if it's cost saving right now, but at the very least, it's cost effective. Um, the, the idea is the more we can identify diseases at the chemical level, at the molecular level, rather than at the symptomatic level, the better we can get about catching them early. Um, rather than just screening every single patient, we'd be able to identify patients that are more at risk for, for those particular sub subcategories of diseases, screen them, you're spending less money, you're catching more diseases. That could lead to cost savings. Um, it may not. There's really no guarantee, but in my mind, that's really uh, where, where, where the future of reducing that skew uh, tends to lie. And uh, that about wraps it up. Um, I think we can move on to questions. When uh, Mrs. Tomography, when it, when it was brought to North Carolina, I think her hospital was the second hospital uh, to actually get it. But even up to this point, they still will not cover like Medicare patients and Medicaid patients because of the price of the scans. Uh, even though they're able to detect uh, cancer, for instance, that probably the, that's smaller than any other any other scan. I know that, that that's a lot less of a it can be tiny. I think it's five millimeters. I think, and they can detect up down to that down to that size. Why would that? I mean, why is it that there's such a problem with the Medicare and Medicaid system? 
when it comes to, is it the price? I think it scans about $3,500. Um, uh, so, sorry, uh, I, I, I couldn't hear very, very clearly, just so I understand. You're, you're saying that the hospital doesn't accept Medicare Medicaid patients? Yeah, they have a... Be, because the price is that, because the, the, the payments that the programs make. Yeah, they won't cover it. Basically, Medicare won't cover it. I'm just, right, right. Oh, okay, Me, uh, Me, Medicare won't, won't, won't cover those. Yeah, patients. so they okay. have to turn a lot of patients away, and they can't get that scan that can actually, you know, detect exactly what type cancer they Right. Have. It's really difficult to uh, you know, make a broad generalization about how, yeah. how, how Medicaid and Medicare make their, make their coverage decisions. Um, it's, it's very bureaucratic. Um, Me Medicaid varies a lot by state. So if you look at one state's program, they'll, they'll cover uh, some treatments, some drugs completely. Others will cover them much more carefully or they won't cover them at all. Um, part of that has to do with Medicaid's more limited budget because um, when, when, when you're the feds, uh, you have a much bigger war chest to draw on. When you're a state, you, you're required to have a balanced budget. So as a state, if your Medicaid spending is growing, you, you constantly have to think about how to cut it. Um, as a federal government, your Medicare spending can grow, but you can try to offset it elsewhere, or you just accept that you have a deficit. Um, me Medicare coverage decisions are uh, a, l a little more complicated. There's a lot of things Medicare doesn't cover that it should. There's a lot of things Medicare shouldn't cover that it does. And um, it takes a lot of time for, uh, for, those, for those changes to happen. Eventually, I think they will. The bureaucracy will catch up. But it's, it's very, very difficult. It's, it's just a long process. I was just, just something I decided to bring up. Yeah. Uh, I'm Greg with the CEO of Scotland Healthcare System, the hospital system next door. I've been there for 25 years. I'm extremely impressed. In one hour, you covered <laughs> everything to do with health, with, with healthcare and healthcare payment. I, I guess I've got really a couple of things that I, I, well, I just I disagree with you a little bit. And one thing that, that I think you, you left out, um, I think I'd start with saying that employers do care. Um, it's still a cost, whether part of it's written off or not, they're still paying that as a cost. And hospitals really negotiate with insurers. Very rarely do we negotiate with employers. And Blue Cross, you know, it's, are a lot bigger than, than, than we are. Um, I think the other thing I would just challenge is someone who also has an economic undergraduate degree is prices are too high. It's a relative term. Sure. The prices aren't necessarily too high if we choose to pay that. So they might be high compared to something else. But to say they're too high is, is really a subjective judgment, I guess, I, I, I challenge a little bit. But the one thing I, I would say I think that's left out is in an area like Robinson County and Scotland County, one of the poorest counties in North Carolina, what's not up there is how much goes to uninsured care. Um, Medicare and Medicaid pay us about 20% less than our cost. We write off about $10 million for uninsured care. And you know we take care of 55,000 folks a year that come to our emergency center regardless of pay. So there's, there's that one issue that's left out of there, I think, is all the free care that also influences prices and the fact that we get paid less influences prices. So I guess the last question that might go with that is there's an awful lot of studies out there that say that states that have adopted the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare, have found that their costs have gone down at the state level, at the Medicaid level, at the hospital level. So I'd welcome any feedback on some of my counterpoint as well as your thoughts on, you know, if states had picked up like North Carolina chose not to, like South Carolina chose not to, if they embraced some of the Affordable Care Act would you see prices go down? Um, you know, the, you're, you're right on, on compensated care. It is, it, it's, it's a part of the healthcare system. Um, you know, the, these, these costs that, that hospitals incur that, that, that no one pays, and hospitals are basically just required to, 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 to cover them. Um, but it's, in, 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 in magnitude, it's, it's relatively small. So uncompensated care is 50 to 60 billion. I think the upper end estimate I've seen is 70 to 80 billion. Um, about half of that ends up ends up being covered so, somehow uh, by the government. I'm, I'm, I'm talking very nationally. It, it, it obviously varies a lot by hospital. Um, and you know, yeah, I think where we can reduce uncompensated care when you where you can give patients insurance, um, you you absolutely should. Um, you know, your your point about the, the price being too high. I, I agree. It's it's very very objective, uh, uh, rather uh, sub subjective. Um, it, it depends what, what you're actually getting for that price. Um, but I think, you know, where, when, when you see, for instance, um, in, in the California example with new replacements, uh, 
this wide, wide variation in uh, knee replacement, hip replacement payments, and you see that variation start to uh, get a little more compact after uh, introducing reference pricing, um, at, at the very least that tells you that prices at those upper end, at that upper end, probably weren't justified. And you know, there, there's of course a lot, a lot of studies that use uh, risk-adjusted measures of price. They try to account for quality differences. Um, even then, it's, it's hard to justify a lot of the price variation. Um, you know, there, there, there are certainly hospitals that you know, do, do a terrific job um, you know, in, in every state, every county. Um, it's, it's just broadly as a, as a national phenomenon. It's, it's, it's getting hard to justify how much, uh, how, how much hospitals get paid for a lot of the procedures that, uh, that may be able to be provided, let's say, at a clinic, at an outpatient clinic, or um, you know, in a physician's office for, for less. And I understand there's cross-subsidies involved, there's cost-shifting that happens. Um, and you, you've got to take that into account. Um, the, the price are still, still, still hard to justify. When you when you uh, mentioned the uh, portion about uh, patents uh, with drug pricing, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, patents not only cover that particular molecule but also all analogs made. Uh, from that molecule. So in essence, an entire, uh, up to hundreds of molecules uh, for a single patent could be, uh, you know, extinguished. Now I know the fact like uh, dextromethorphan and heroin are two totally different uh, drugs, the difference only being a alcohol. But uh, when you're dealing with all these variants of uh, molecules, do you think if they only allow patents to be done on uh, one particular compound, would that uh, incentivize almost like a uh, branding effect? So you would have one company selling this drug and one selling this uh, compound and both being having similar activities. Um, yeah, I, it, it sounds like you, you probably know the, uh, the underlying science a little better than I do. Um, but, you know, uh, my, my, my preferred approach isn't to touching uh, narrow patents. I personally scrap the patent system and just move to data ex exclusivity. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like jiggering around with um, the, the specifics of what a patent covers. I'd rather tell a company, you know, you perform these clinical trials to get your drug approved. No one else can use this data to get a drug approved. Um, but if another company wants to go and uh, conduct their own clinical trials for the same exact uh, set of molecules and get their drug approved, they can go and compete with you. Um, I think that would introduce more competition um, in the branded drug space. Uh, so you, you, you'd still have generics after, after the fact, but you, under, under an exclusivity approach rather than a patent approach, I think you'd, you'd have the kind of competition you're looking for. Um, I th uh, you know, if, if you're talking about only being able to patent you know, the, the individual molecules uh, rather than the whole set of them that, that make up the drug, um, I'm, really, I'm, I'm not sure what, what effect that, that would ultimately have. I'm not sure if you'd see um, companies uh, merging more often. Um, if, if you, uh, you know, so, so if you're merging, you're taking, you're taking advantage of economies of scale because you can get all the, all the compounds under one roof. Uh, if you're doing that, that's not necessarily a good thing. I think in that case you might see higher prices. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not. I'm not sure which which way it would go. Um, definitely go both ways. Uh, yeah. Do you think part of the problem with pharmaceutical corporates not having capped prices is because of their strength in the federal government with special pa with you know special packs with the congressmen and such because they are the largest special interest group now in the federal government. Uh, say say the last part. I'm sorry. They are they are they have a stronger um, special interest group than even the oil companies now. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, I, I'm I'm not sure. If, uh, I don't know if I'd say that they have a stronger special interest group than oil companies. Um, but you know, every every industry lobbies. Um, you know, w uh, with 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 pharmaceuticals, we we do have uh, price controls in some programs. So we we have price controls in the VA. We have price controls in Medicaid, effectively. Um, 
for, uh, for hospitals. We have a 340B program, which uh, requires a massive discount for them. Um, and it's, it's not clear that those price controls do much to affect uh, total spending in those programs. Um, you know, if, if we really want to experiment, sure, we, we could try to uh, mandate um, Medicaid level rebates, let's say, in, uh, in Medicare Part D, uh, in the program for seniors. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much, how much that would do to actual prices versus uh, just reduce drug availability on formularies. Um, there's a good, uh, a good analysis from last year from the uh, Government Accountability Office that looked at uh, gross drug prices, so but before the mandated rebate, they actually found that Part D gets a better price pre-rebate than, um, than Medicaid when, when you take all the payments into account. So you know, the, the, the Part D plans, the insurers themselves are doing a decent job of standing up to, to drug companies that try to hike spending. Um, if you look at some of the high-cost drugs lately, uh, Savaldi and Hermoni uh, for Hep C, uh, when, when a competitor uh, was introduced, um, uh, the VPAC by, by AbbVie, uh, the insurers were able to negotiate discounts of about 50%. Um, CVM, with, with the recent uh, PCSK9 inhibitors for, uh, for cholesterol for state-resistant uh, patients, um, CVS, I think, said that they're not, going to be, uh, they're not going to be covering it until there's a second drug in the market. Um, I, I, I think insurers, can do a pretty good job, and if they can't, then frankly, why do we have insurers? Um, if, if insurers are saying that they can't deal with drug prices, then we have a different, uh, a, a different debate that needs to happen. Yeah, you mentioned shifting some of the um, healthcare costs uh, from government funding to healthcare, or I'm sorry, employer-based coverages. Do you think shifting those costs to an employer-based employer plan opens the door to discrimination based on healthcare conditions. And I clearly, if I'm operating a business and I'm trying to save healthcare costs, I'm liable to hire the guy that's healthy versus the guy that comes in with a pre-existing condition. Um, sure, I mean, that discrimination happens. It's, it's illegal. Um, it, it should be illegal. Uh, you know, we, we, we try to police it as much as possible. The, the incentives are certainly there. Um, but the, those kind of incentives exist for, uh, you know, for, for pretty much everything under the sun. You know, uh, there, there are things that, that are discrimination that we don't call discrimination. I mean, as an employer, you have an incentive to just hire better educated workers, even if they'll take uh, you know, more or less the same salary, let's say, because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, um, a loose employ, uh, employment market. Um, we just don't call that discrimination. Uh, you you, you want to avoid any of those negative incentives, uh, sure. Um, but I, I think the, the net effect of shifting some, some more of the costs um, away from tax expenditures and directly to employers would just uh, encourage employers to offer less health insurance broadly. And I, I think generally health economists across the spectrum, on the left, on the right, in the middle, agree that employer-sponsored coverage is a really inefficient way of offering health insurance, um, if, if nothing else, just because it forces workers into, uh, into a job often just because of, uh, of health insurance coverage. You mentioned a moment ago that it's very difficult to tell how sick the population is. Mm -hmm. and, but at the same time, life insurance companies seem to have that down to a science. <laughs> And I wonder if you think that's because of the lock-in effect, where we let people repick a health plan every year, but people keep their life insurance for 30, 40 years. Um, yeah, the, that's a big part of it. So the life insurance companies know that they've locked you in for, let's say, 30 years, and they have a stream of pay, uh, payments that's coming from you one way or another. Um, it's, it's much easier to price that than pricing insurance, where workers can shift in and out uh, year over year, month over month. Um, and the, this one of the problems with, with insurers covering drugs like Sovaldi or, or Havoni for, for Hep C that are extremely cost effective but very expensive on the front end. Um, if you're an insurer, you don't want to have a massive outlay in year one and year two and then lose the patient when, you know, in year 10 another insurer is going to have them and benefit from the lower cost of that patient. Um, Long-term health insurance contracts, I think, are, would, would be the ideal way to, to do this, um, practically speaking. It's very, very hard to implement. Um, 
from a financial perspective, uh, I think John Cochran at the University of Chicago, he, uh, he wrote a paper on this in 98, 99. Um, and the mechanics can work if you assume really hyper-rational uh, consumers, but if you drop that assumption, it, do it doesn't work too well. I think the, the second best approach is risk adjustment. Um, the better your risk adjustment, the less incentive you have for insurers to try to um, avoid sick patients or, um, or, 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 or only take uh, healthy patients. So you know, even though you're doing your risk adjustment only year by year, um, the, that insurer, let's say, that pays for the Hep C drug in year one, um, you know, kn knows that if in year ten um, they've they've got this this worse risk pool and someone else has a better risk pool than them, they'd still get some kind of payment from them. Um, it might not fully offset it, but it'll affect decisions at the margins. I think. Thank you, Evgeny Feynman. Um, I've enjoyed this discussion. You did certainly cover quite a bit of, uh, of ground on the, the various, several of the reasons for uh, the, the high cost of healthcare in the United States. Um, so, again, thank you. Let's just have another round of applause for Mr. Feynman. And uh, we do have refreshments for everybody at the back. <laughs>